joined by David Schwartz, the CTO of Ripple. This is our first time meeting you in person, at least my yeah. first time, but we've done the podcast before. So this is a really exciting opportunity to do this you know, live. So thanks for joining. My pleasure. I can't believe you guys have like put a podcast studio in the middle of consensus. It's, it's <laughs> Neither just can amazing. I. We're still getting used to it. So you're going to have to come along this journey with us. But can you talk to us a little bit, maybe, David, just um, to begin with, like, what's your reaction been to this conference? I know you've been to these several times. Does this feel any different? I think probably the biggest difference is a greater mix of developers than I usually see. So usually at consensus, it's mostly business people and like number go up speculators who are just here because they don't know what else, to, how else to like participate. But there've been a, I, I've seen a lot of developers here, a lot of positive talk about actual constructive uses, um, and I think that's exciting. There's a lot of excitement around AI, around bringing institutions on, and I think there's a there's a sense here that we're close to that kind of inflection point where we get both sort of institutional adoption and grassroots adoption to really ignite that sort of mass use that I think we all are, are hoping to see. Uh, David, uh, you know, somebody like you who's just been around this space, you know, almost as long as anybody, I'm curious and, and focusing on Ripple, what you're working on at Ripple Labs and XRP Ledger, have you learned anything? Uh, did you, have you had any eureka moments from other projects or any other technology or a speech or a meeting that you had that that was surprising or interesting to you i think the the excitement around ai has kind of has kind of been surprising to okay. me at how quickly um people sort of realize that there's going to be some kind of synergy between blockchain and ai not sure exactly what that is but i think there's a lot of very interesting developments in that direction and i think the institutional adoption of real DeFi use cases, which is something that you wouldn't expect because they're subject to all of the regulatory compliance. And I think people have found ways to mix the need for regulatory compliance without creating an island that's, you know, what, what nobody wants is an institutional use case that's on a blockchain for no particular reason, you know, where it actually does enable DeFi. Like the, the case where that's the most obvious is a stable coin. Stable coin is the most regulated thing possibly in all of the space. And yet people are using these stable coins anonymously in completely DeFi decentralized applications. And I think that synergy and ignition is, is, is really exciting. Now, y'all just yesterday announced your roadmap and that includes kind of a, a big institutional DeFi focus. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The idea that institutions can build things that are very strictly, reg very tightly regulated, things like lo portfolios of traditional loans that are heavily regulated, but they can interoperate with DeFi systems. So for example, you might have a regulated lender who issues very traditional real estate or, 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 or commercial loans, and then you might have tokenization of that debt that then anyone can hold in a purely DeFi system. And I think if you look at like the way systems grow, if you look at the way the internet grew, there was government and military adoption that enabled grassroots adoption that built the system that that synergy is what really builds something that can you know be dominant that can be dominant that can really grow and i think i think we see we see that corner we see the xrp ledger as being a blockchain where those kinds of use cases can really work you know um, we are a tech podcast and you mentioned that you've seen a bigger developer presence here this year at consensus i'm wondering you know are you taking any inspiration from like the tech conversations and bringing that to the Ripple ecosystem? Like I'm thinking zero knowledge, right? That's been a hot topic, maybe restaking. We're seeing like layer one protocols become a layer two all of a sudden. So are you, what are you taking into consideration like with these big techie trends and how that might maybe applied to, to the XRP the, ledger? The biggest one for me particularly is interoperability. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody would use the internet if it was just one website, you know, um, and I, I think the same thing is going to happen with blockchains. Blockchains are going to be, there are going to be some that like Bitcoin are basically just move an asset. Mm -hmm. And there are some like Ethereum where you can bring any use case you want, but it's not particularly great for payments or it's not particularly great for like large scale data storage. It may not be great for AI. It, but if we have all of these specialized solutions that don't work together and people are going to constantly have to think about, you know, when you use an, a website, you don't have to think about what hardware they're using, what software they're using, how they connect. It all just works. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to come up with technology that allow the entire system to just work for people so that they don't have to think, oh, I have my funds on this blockchain or the token I want to buy is over on this other blockchain. And I see a lot of people who are, bit, we don't really know how to do that very well yet. There are a lot of people who think they, you know, when you're, when you're pushing a technology, it's tempting to say that it solves every problem perfectly. But we all know that interoperability is going to be something we're going to be working on for a long time. And it's just going to gradually get better. But I think like the very first step of that is token portability. And there's a lot of companies that I've spoken to who have really, 
really good solutions to that. And I think like that is the the, the baby step that, that you know we absolutely have to have. But if people have to think about what blockchains they're using, what technologies they're using, then we're never going to get messed up. But what specifically are those challenges then with interoperability? Because we're seeing all sorts of different solutions around that too. Um, even like, you know, I'm thinking like Polygon is coming out with his own ag layer, right? Where they're sort of keeping everything in their system so that like the different chains within their Polygon ecosystem can sort of interact with each other. Or, um, you know, what was it called? Um, it storage proofs. So you don't even need to like move your assets over to another chain. You have proof that like it sits on another chain. So I'm just sort of wondering what sort of solutions you're thinking of in interoperability to these challenges. There are a number of different dilemmas that you run into with these solutions that sound really good, and they do work. I'm mm -hmm. not saying they don't work, that there's these dilemmas you run into when you want people to rely on them for perhaps tens of billions of dollars. Like one of the core problems is most of these technologies have ways that they can fail that are very improbable, but can happen. So an example with a zero knowledge proof system is you may get into a situation and you can prove that this can happen where nobody can advance the system, where nobody can produce a zero knowledge proof that will satisfy the system. And either you have some governance process that can unjam the system when that happens or you don't and if you don't then it's like the nuclear reactor that it probably won't melt down but if it does like everybody loses everything mm -hmm. the other problem that you have is you can't steal bitcoin from the bitcoin blockchain because there's no place else you can take it you can't steal xrp from the xrp ledger so when you're trusting systems like mining or consensus you're trusting them not to double spend or not to rewind the ledger but you're not trusting them not to steal billions of dollars from the blockchain because they can't it's impossible there's no place they could take it when you have these bridged interoperability systems like when you have wrapped bitcoin someone is protecting the real bitcoin from being stolen and the dilemma you run into is either they're making a lot of money or they're not making a lot of money. If they're making a lot of money, the system is very expensive because you're the ones paying them all this money to do it. If bridges are expensive, people won't won't find them interesting. If they're not making a whole lot of money, they're heavily incentivized to steal the, the actual underlying Bitcoin and run. And if you design technical systems to prevent them from stealing the Bitcoin, you run into the same problem that if these technical systems break, is there somebody who can unbreak them? Well, then they might unbreak them when they're not broken. So when when Ripple kind of first hit the the scene, I, I forget how many years ago. Remind me, it was twenty fourteen. Well, I started working on what became Ripple in late twenty eleven. Twenty eleven. The company was late twenty twelve. Okay, so around that time frame, there was some initial hostility that we've talked about before towards Ripple and its sort of institution centric approach. And it does feel like things have changed. I mean, we're talking a lot about regulation. We're talking about ETFs um, from Blackstone, BlackRock, and um, rather, and, and all of these different you know entities. What does it feel like, you know, from your seat? Do you feel like people have kind of evolved to the Ripple worldview, or you know, it must feel different for you, um, given all of that criticism you got initially. Yeah, I, I, I think the undeniable piece of proof is stable coins like USDC and Tether they are as institutional a thing as you can possibly get. And yet they are what's what's fueling these completely decentralized economies. I, I think you can't deny right now that, that the institutional adoption is gonna enable grassroots adoption and vice versa. I think the thing that we were too early on is when we were trying to bring institutions on for their payments, they weren't gonna bring their customers to blockchains, right? Like if your bank is using, you know, um, is using, so, you know, let's say, say they're using, let's say they're using Ripple's payment technology and they're using blockchains and they're using XRP and payments. You as a customer, it's invisible to you. They're not going to bring you into the blockchain space. Yeah. What's exciting about this second wave of sort of institutional adoption is that they are either bringing their customers directly onto the blockchain or they're enabling people to do things on the blockchain. Sure. I think I, I think you have to accept that like if there's going to be mass adoption, it's going to be these sort of hand in hand. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I think people were skeptical about that I think now the evidence is undeniable is that that wouldn't mean that everything would have to be regulated. I think the thing right. that people didn't realize is that like you can have a stable coin or a loan portfolio or a tokenized security that's completely thoroughly regulated. They do KYC yeah. AML on every single customer. And yet on the back end, there's tokens that represent ownership interest or collateralization against that that are completely decentralized. So that's like we see that now. On, on that note, David, thank you so much for joining us. It's super cool to speak to you in person, see you in person, and yeah, great insights as always. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. I, I, I still I cannot believe you guys like built a podcast studio <laughs> in the middle of a conference with our Crazy. own hands. And the I hands wish I wish everybody could see that what they've got here. It's an amazing setup. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.